Hi, I'm Steve Hamilton, presenting for CityTrap. Now, those of you who are familiar with our work will know that I've been advocating for public transit agencies to deploy a technology called personal rapid transit. When people first hear about PRT, they usually catch on rather quickly to how it can offer much better transit service than traditional line haul big box transit. When trying to do their due diligence, almost without exception, their first challenge question is, can it handle the capacity we need? Now, I don't want to be accusatory, but offering that question reveals a fundamental misunderstanding of the subject matter. I'm sorry, but if that's what you ask, then you don't really know what you're talking about, which is why it's doubly disheartening when the questioner is not a public official, but instead is a transit professional. The entire reason for this presentation is to eliminate this misunderstanding with a little education. The primary reason we use big box transit, that is large high occupancy vehicles, is not for capacity, it's economics. So let me show you. Here we have a graph showing an, an example demand curve for a high ridership corridor. It shows the minute by minute demand for a 20 hour operating day, starting at 5 a.m. and running till about 1 a.m. the following day. As is typical, the demand is characterized by two rush hour peaks, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. This shows those peaks following a normal distribution with plus or minus two sigma points representing about a four hour peak. Normally, there's some small off-peak demand. We're showing none here. Now, that's not to mislead. Rather, it's to make the issue more clear. This essentially maximizes the height of the peaks. For comparison purposes to Miami-Dade, the beach corridor ridership is about two to 3,000 higher than what's shown here. And the South Corridor Transitway ridership is about two to 3,000 lower than what's shown here. These are the two highest ridership corridors in Dade County. So this example is a realistic approximation of our maximum cases. Now this demand reaches a peak of about 3,100 riders per hour, which is a nice round number. It works out to 52 riders per minute. Now that's a nice round number because the 40-foot buses that we use offer seating positions for 52 people. So to meet this peak demand, we need to supply one bus per minute. Now, if on the other hand, rather than using big buses, we use normal cars with seating for four passengers, then we would need to move 13 cars per minute to carry the same number of passengers at this peak. So the question is, can we do that? Well, you know, if you don't think we can do that, then you should go hang around outside the Dolphin Stadium or the Marlin Stadium about 20 minutes after a game ends. Even a relatively small crowd, say 20,000 people, still requires 5,000 cars at 4,000 people per car. If they take a full hour to depart, that's still a rate about six and a half times more than 13 cars per minute. Our traffic planners have to answer this same question, but in a much more precise fashion. At what rate can cars flow down a single lane of road? The answer varies depending on how fast the cars are traveling. A simple function describes that relationship. It depends only upon the parking density of the cars and the reaction time of the human drivers. It's a, what's called a monotonically increasing function which just as an aside, explains how traffic jams occur. Now, as you can see in this graph, at any speed above about five miles an hour, more than 13 cars per minute can flow. At speeds which are easily achievable, cars can flow at a rate almost three times that amount. So we see that even using a single leg and vehicles seating only four passengers we can realistically support a capacity that is three times larger than the highest demand corridors we have. 
The answer to the question is yes. Low occupancy vehicles can supply the capacity we need. Hmm. So why don't we use them? As I said at the start, the reason we use big box solutions is economic. But as we can see here, it's not related to capital cost. A single bus costs about $500,000. It's likely we could buy cars for less than $38,500, especially if we buy them 13 at a time. So capital costs would likely be lower for the small box approach. Operations expenses, however, tell a different story. Let's assume we get the cars at $35,000 each. And let's assume we can wear out the vehicles and replace them every five years. Actually, eight to 12 years is the standard for buses, but let's be more aggressive than that and treat both cars and buses the same way. However, for every vehicle, we need a driver. Driver salaries run about $50,000 per year, perhaps a little more with benefits loaded in. Remember, we have a 20-hour operating day, so for each vehicle, we need multiple shifts of drivers. In the off-peak hours, we may operate fewer vehicles, so a fractional driver is a reasonable uh, thing to do. Now, in reality, there are other personnel we should count to clean the vehicles and to perform maintenance. But let's just look here at the driver salaries, which are the same for both types of vehicles. In fact, they are the biggest portion of our vehicle operating expenses. Comparing the total per vehicle operating expense, which combines both the annual purchase cost and the driver expense, we see that our 13 to 1 ratio is now gone. It's now less than 2 to 1. So then when we normalize for passenger capacity, we see a huge advantage in operating expenses for the big box solution in the neighborhood of a seven to one advantage. That is why we have historically chosen a big box solution for public transit. It is not passenger capacity. It is operating expenses, specifically its driver salaries. Our drivers are, are our most expensive components, so we have to amortize that expense across a large set of riders. Thus, we use high occupancy vehicles. Now, unfortunately, this is also the fallacy of the big box transit approach. Having a big box is not enough to guarantee that amortization. We actually need the riders to show up. The same vehicle demand graph that I showed earlier is at the top here. But we can kind of look at it in a different way. The horizontal line is drawn at 26 riders per minute, or about 50% capacity. And we can see from where it crosses the ridership curve that demand only meets or exceeds that level for just under a quarter of the day. We can do this for any ridership level or vehicle count level. If we plot those then, the results are shown in the bottom graph. Since the range is so much wider by doing it this way, we use a log graph for the Y instead of a, a, a linear graph. If we look at the bus count curve, that's the green one, we see that demand only achieves the one bus per minute level at the very peaks. Essentially, for 99% of the operating day, ridership is lower than that level. So we are always operating below our op cost-optimized point. Now, rather than accept this inefficiency, the common solution is to make riders wait. The horizontal line at one per five minutes shows this point where it intersects the green curve. We make riders wait between one and five minutes so that we can operate the buses full. But even this only works about 28% of the day. Beyond that, we must operate the buses partially full. We can, of course, further reduce bus frequency to counter this. 
but at some point we reach some minimum service level, like maybe one every 30 minutes, uh, which is the other line in the graph. Once ridership drops below that level, then our buses tend to either operate with one passenger or none. As the graph shows, empty buses are common for almost 40% of the operating day. The lesson should be clear. No matter how big the bus is, the economic benefit cannot be realized if the ridership is not there. This is why using still bigger buses, articulated and double articulated buses with 60 to 90 passenger capacity for high frequency, especially high frequency BRT routes, makes absolutely no sense. Big box transit is already characterized by an unwinnable tug of war between operating efficiency and level of service, that is rider wait times. The bigger the bus, the more intense that tug of war is. As a service provider, why would you want to do that to yourself? Now, it's worthy to note the orange line. The small box approach allows the number of vehicles per minute to be reduced. The 23.5% of the day above that horizontal line can be served with between six and a half and 13 cars per minute without making any rider wait at all. And there's plenty of room for further reduction before it's necessary to start making riders wait. A maximum five minute wait can be provided for almost 55% of the day. To make this as clear as possible, let's consider this example. We have a big box solution. The schedule that we're running is targeted at providing service for 10.4 people per minute. That's 20% of the peak rate in our first graph. The plan and schedule curves show this, right? The gray shows the plan for people arriving at the station at the planned rate. Some are lucky, they arrive just before the bus leaves. Others are unlucky. They arrive just after the previous bus left and so have to wait for the entire headway. On average, riders have to wait half of the headway. Since the headway is five minutes, the average wait time is two and a half minutes. That's about a 7% penalty if I've got a 30 minute commute. So that's reasonably good service and we can provide it. The problem is the red shows the actual ridership that shows up. Note their average wait time is the same as for the plan but when the bus leaves, it's only half full. So the service is not as economical as planned. With a big box solution, the adjustment usually made is to eliminate buses, doubling the headway. This permits the remaining buses to operate at or near full, which restores their economic efficiency. Unfortunately, it also doub doubles the average wait time and doubles the total wait time. That's the sum of the wait time for everybody. You see more red in this picture, right? This is a direct measure of the quality of the service. The more red, the worse the service. There's a very real limit to the extent to which this can be done. The distance the rider needs to travel is unchanged, and thus the time spent traveling is unchanged. The added wait time represents an increasingly large percentage of this overall trip. As that percentage grows above 10%, it becomes noticeable. As it grows past 15%, it becomes increasingly unacceptable. And what happens is our riders go find a faster solution and stop showing up. Now, adjusting this mismatch between supply and demand is easy and direct using a small box solution. We just reduce the number of cars showing up every five minutes. In actuality, these cars would probably be spread out across the five minute interval, so the average wait times would be even lower. Clearly, this adjustment provides far better service and it's much easier for the provider to make. As long as the number of cars per minute is greater than one, then lowering the supply to match the demand is easy. So 
We see that the small box solution provides better service and is easier to adjust to maintain its economic efficiency. The problem is its economic viability is broken in the first place. So of course, that is the problem that we ought to be solving. It's not our aim to put drivers out of a job, okay? But the economics and workability of the system, unfortunately, demand it. With automated driving, the cost of a driver essentially goes to zero. That makes the small box solution not just viable, but superior to the big box solution. So the logical solution is for us to use small automated vehicles. Now everybody in the transit community is eagerly awaiting the availability of self-driving vehicles. But realistically, reliable CAVs are still years away from being ready. The problem that they're trying to solve is very hard. Safely and efficiently sharing the driving environment with other cars, human drivers, bicyclists, pedestrians, and now scooters is extremely complex. This problem can be made much simpler by restricting operations to a protected and exclusive guideway. That is what APMs have been doing for 40 years now. APMs are by far the safest form of ground transportation that exists. Now the group rapid transit system that exists in Morgantown, West Virginia, is an advanced network form of APM. It's operated for 43 years and provided over 190 million passenger miles without a single accident. Recently, just after equipment upgrades occurred, it encountered its first very minor accident. It provides about 16,000 rides per day at an operating cost of about 51 cents per ride. This despite being a custom solution using 45 year old technology. Newer and better systems using smaller vehicles are now available. These are called personal rapid transit. Some PRT systems have been operating for almost a decade. Even when these networks, uh, network capable systems or actually used in just simple line haul fashion, they're still far better than tradi the traditional big box approach. As I've shown you, they have more than enough capacity for what we need, and they offer far superior service characteristics to the riders. And they enable the service provider to easily adjust capacity to match demand. In fact, they make it feasible to operate high quality transit service the type that might actually get people out of their cars in a way that can actually be profitable? Let me repeat that. Transit can be both competitive with cars and profitable. So now you can see why I'm a fan of PRT. It's based upon understanding what motivates both the rider and the service provider. So there are just a few things that I hope you can remember from this presentation. First, I hope you've been disabused of the big boxes for capacity fallacy. We use big box solutions because drivers are very expensive. Second, hopefully now you understand how the limitations in the big box solution force us to provide poor quality service, which drives away ridership or forces us to run a system that loses a ton of money. Third, automated driving is the way to end that tug of war. And it makes the small box solution the obvious choice. Finally, please take note that the automation we need has been available to us and in use for decades. Thanks for investing your time. I hope you found it educational 
and worthwhile.